So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first introduce this position, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, topic of today's class, which is Botvinnik. And so in a kind of hilarious thing, Greg Shahada, who doesn't really like to study the classics or to study at all, has got this class studying classic players. And maybe that's because he doesn't want to do it on his own and wants us to help him, <laughs> which was fine with me. Um, so um, I think one interesting question that, you know, you get in a, just uh, sets itself up immediately is to be like, well, Greg, why? Why are we doing this? And it's not necessarily totally clear even to me, and I'm the first to be like, these games are really interesting. Uh, and what I mean by interest is interest to you guys are like, what value is there for you to be studying these historic games? Um, and I'm going to try to get into that a little bit. Um, it is a different time in a lot of ways, these games, to what we're doing now. But I do think that if you understand some things about these games, it'll definitely help your chess, not only the plans and the ideas, but just how chess used to be played, how people used to think about chess. Okay, so uh, first, let me just say that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna speak a little bit, but at, while I'm speaking, please consider this position. Black has just played Rook a d8. This is Smyslov Botvinnik, and um, Smyslov is black. And it's a really interesting question, a position. I haven't looked at the computer. I have my own opinions about what's going on here. But the question is basically, what should white do? And like, just who's better and why? It's really kind of an open question. And I can reveal like what the players thought of the position as well. And let me just let me go back a couple moves because it's kind of interesting where in this position, Black played ambitiously d5 and basically, I think, uh, decided to get this structure with the doubled f pawns, right? And so we get precisely the position that we see on the board. Pretty logical progression from that d5 move. Okay, so the question is, who is better and why? What should white do? Um, please, you know, put, if you want to say something, uh, write me in the chat, put an exclam after it, and I'll, I'll try to call on you. I'm going to talk just a little bit about Botvinnik, though, to give you a chance to think about the position yourself. Okay, <clears throat> now in some ways, I want to say I'm not a huge fan of Botvinnik. <laughs> first, I'll say why. Um, <clears throat> first, it just feels dirty, a lot of the things that he did. He was the poster boy of the Soviet Union, and uh, there was some grubby things that went down, especially things to do with keeping him world champion. And that's not entirely his fault. He's, you know, kind of a puppet of the state, but still the grubbiness associated with that of having people uh, lose to you or draw to you on purpose. And <clears throat> even if you considered yourself like morally pure, just knowing that it happened, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of an ugly thing. But like I said, n none of the players of that time were above that, and that continued even in Karpov's era. There was a a thing I just read to, heard today on the Perpetual Chess podcast that was amazing. That uh, for eleven years Karpov didn't lose one single game to a Soviet player. And <laughs> a little bit similar in Botvinnik's time, it was just not cool to lose to him. So let me just give some basics. The guy's born like 1911 or something like that. I could get that wrong, but it's early 1900s there. And really the time of Botvinnik is like 1948. So post-World War all the way to 1963. And in this time, this weird thing happens where this is also where it feels a little grubby. He always got to do a return match. So he like wins the first match against Smyslov, my sensei then uh, loses, but then has a right to another rematch and wins that one. Same thing with Tall. Loses to Tall in 1960, wins the rematch. And with Petrosian, there's also two matches. 
and that goes all the way to 63. It feels like actually a much longer time than it actually is, just because there's so many famous names in there, you know, Smyslov, Tall, Petrosian, kind of icons of the game. And then even before, of course, uh, even before World War II, he had the chance to play with Alekhine, who Kosia will pronounce something like Alyoshin, you know, something fancy like that. Uh, so he had a chance to play those guys. And um, that's its own epic there in the late 30s, like the famous Avro tournament in uh, 1938, for example. And um, we're going to actually look at a game with Alekhine a little later. Okay, now, the next thing I want to say about Botvinnik, this is a little bit of a joke, but it's very true, is it was incredibly formative about the way the Soviet school thought, uh, really the authority, the patriarch, if you will. So anytime you hear something like the Soviet chess school, you should be thinking, oh, that's actually Botvinnik. And um, the... Um, School itself can be characterized as something, for one, I believe in, that you should analyze your games thoroughly and subject that analysis to some kind of public uh, critique, you know, putting it out there. Um, the guy himself, though, Bobnik, is really, I would say, what I would call a dogmatist. You know, he didn't really ever change his mind about anything, whether it was chess or politics or anything like that. He never changed his mind. So a lot of the analysis that he does doesn't feel to me as fresh as I would like it to be. But that being said, it really does um, form the bedrock of that school. And a funny thing that I was going to say as a joke, but it's very true, is if you, ask, if you ever want to ask yourself, what does Botvinnik believe? It's the exact opposite of everything Greg Shahada believes. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a joke. I'm saying it like that. I should put this is, by the way, this is the position, Rook AD8, white to move. What do you think of the position? What should white do? <clears throat> but it really is true. Uh, Greg Shahada believes in blitz chess. And if you ever played blitz chess around Botvinnik, you'd be very angry. Uh, Botvinnik didn't believe in playing Swiss tournaments. You can't even be in the United States without playing Swiss tournaments. And he didn't believe even in slow-ish time controls, believed you needed time to go over all your games before the next tournament. And um, it's kind of interesting then, you know, he gets in a real fight with Kasparov when Kasparov's a kid and Kasparov wants to go off and play these tournaments and the Patriarch's like, no, dude, you don't, <laughs> you're not ready yet. Um, and that's the other thing about Petro, or excuse me, Botvinnik as well, is that later in his life, he's like got this school and Kasparov's involved, all, all these famous other names are involved in his school. Um, a book I want to mention while you guys are thinking about this is one of the famous books is Botvinnik's 100 Selected Games. Uh, <clears throat> and what's kind of cool about the book is it is uh, really an annotated selection before he becomes world champion. And the reason that's kind of cool and interesting is then Kasparov copies that with another famous book, a book I think is even better, The Test of Time, uh, which is also you know a selection of his games annotated before he becomes world champion. Okay, so um, let's do this. If you think you have an opinion about what is going on here, and an idea of what white should do, give me an exclam and um, you know write something in the chat, and I can call on you. And also, we um, I'm going to admit some people in the waiting room. I hope that's okay. And um, so we will then maybe as I'm waiting, I'll can talk more about Botvinnik. Um, this position. Let me, let's say this while we're waiting about it. I'll just say something general. One of the things that's very tricky today as well is how do you develop, the, how do you understand the dynamic between bishops and knights? Um, in particular, when are knights going to be better than bishops? And kind of back in the day, at this point of time, in any ways, before Fisher, it's kind of thought like knights are about the same as bishops. Um, just because the bishop, yeah, it was just thought, oh, about the same, you know, about the same. And so you got to understand already, we have a whole modern prejudice 
for the bishop in this position, really coming from not really Fisher, but the computers. Okay. So we have one comment, and I'm just going to read it because it doesn't have an exclam. Is white is better because the structure is slightly better, and C file is slightly better for white. And here I would play knight e4, possibly rook c1. Okay. Yeah. Lots of different ideas. Uh, the question about knight e4, of course, is what would what would happen after f5, right? And in general, let's say the f the the light squares like that f5 square. It's a big question about how or what white wants to do about f5. Okay. So let's admit the famous Robert Perez. <laughs> okay, Ariane has something to say. Let's call on him. And I just dropped my book. That was that loud crash that you heard. So ask to unmute. Ariane, what do you got for us? Here, I like d4 because I uh -huh. get knight e4. There's counterplay with f5 for black, mm -hmm. which is unnecessary to face. So stop it with d4 first and then knight e4. And you can even bring a piece to e f5 later. Okay, good. And, and what do you think? White's better there? Yeah, white's better. Okay, good. That's very helpful. That's very helpful. Anybody else have an opinion on the, on this position? A lot of other people are are seconding that that idea, and I think that it's an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me just say a little bit. You know, my uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying Smyslov. Last time I was on the show, I talked about Smyslov and the idea that you need someone to follow. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about Smyslov's hmm, let's call it chess prejudices, if you like. And this is a position I actually disagree with Smyslov on. It's kind of interesting. Smyslov, by the way, thinks that black, if anybody, let's put it this way, if anybody's better, black's better. That's his opinion. And maybe I'll first show what white did. And um, I think Aryan and others who mentioned basically this idea of 94, G4, it is very much uh, Botvinnik's, let's call it intuition as well, to play it that way. So let's look. So first he played rook fd1. And this just, since it's threatening b7, um, <clears throat> we get b6, now g4. And the interesting thing now about g4 that I think Botvinnik didn't appreciate is now we get this square. And one of the curious things when you're facing the bishop, right, is you really kind of want the, the pawns on the color of the bishop. So if we are facing the bishop, we want our pawns on dark squares to blunt the bishop. And so Smyslov does a pretty, it, it is amazing what he does here, even though I disagree with his assessment of that initial position, let's just see what he does. Because if knight e4, then bishop f4 followed by f5. So it still looks maybe superficially. Maybe, maybe I'll just show that actually. So if you play knight e4, bishop f4, and if black achieves f5, he's saying I'm better. He's saying I'm better. And the knight, of course, the b6 pawn does do a job there on with, with that move. So queen f5. I can imagine Botvinnik still thinking he was better here. Rook d4, rook e d8. And this is the clever part, is that the um, knight, if it takes on f6, it's going to get stranded. And this is the clever thing on Smyslov's part, that actually black is the one who is better. Black is the one who is knocking as we like to say at the chess dojo, black is the one who knocks. So anyways, king f1 happens, and we get this very rich ending where black is the one who is pressing, very impressive really, to let him take on f6, just with the idea that whenever he does so, the knight is going to get discombobulated. And I'll just show a little bit here. 
And this is this whole uh, terrible, terrible ending here for Botvinnik. And he, this, I think back in the day, by the way, they had these things called adjournments and this was where it was adjourned. And right, the knight is just not gonna get out of his mess. So let me go back and I'll just share my own thoughts. And if we want, we can turn on the computer because I'm willing to be wrong on this point. I'm always, I guess I'm, I like to say anyways that I'm always willing to be wrong. Um, <clears throat> so I want to say this, I feel like, you know, I studied a lot of classic games as a kid and definitely like the thing that stands out here is F5. And the more I thought about it though, I was just like, you know what? Maybe the biggest thing about this position is the fact that our king is better. And so I came up with just a totally different plan, which I think is much better for white. And you guys can tell me if you think I'm full of it here. So queen b7, I'm assuming rook d3, and then knight e4. And basically, whenever I'm ready, for example, if you push me with f5, I'm just going to play knight c5. And my queen is active. Uh, I'm going to get the pass C pawn. And to me, I don't know if it's winning or anything, but it seems very unpleasant for black because his king is always going to be drafty. And then, of course, at the same time, I, I guess I'm going to have either a powerful knight on C5 or I'm going to have a beautiful pawn that I can support with one of these rooks. So that, to me, seemed uh, a big deal. And we have a question. Am I scared of e4, e3? Let's look, because I think that if I was black, that would indeed be at least the thing I would try. So let's look. f5 here. There's all kinds of moves black can do, by the way. For example, at any point, black can play rook d7. So e4, let's look. And obviously, black is free to change up the move order here at any point. Uh, my first question would be, I guess, can we just play c6, right? And if e3, I guess my first question would be, again, c7. And uh, like I said, it just, it just looks real bad for me for black. We're going to get a, a rook on, uh, on c1. And this guy is still, you know, we never dealt with that guy falling. Queen a7 at some point. So let's look again, queen d7. Like I said, we can turn on the computer too, but it's just interesting to look at it through ideas first. And again, my idea was more like I disagreed with my sensei because in this position, it felt like we're going to lose the battle on the king side. And then that c pawn is just going to be a monster. Okay. So, all right. I'll cheat. <laughs> I'll cheat a little bit. We'll see what it says. Um, and, uh, oh, you know what, guys? This is hilarious. I'm going to show, I'm going to make it bigger. And look at that. Somebody says I'm wrong. Let's see. I, so I, I guess I'm wrong. Let's check it out. Knight c5. Funnily enough, the computer, the reason I showed it, it was initially it was saying that, that black was like much better. And now it's saying it's equal. Interesting. Now, this computer is just the chess.com computer, so it's not that special. Let's look at, let's just do the intuitive move that I did. Oh, and it wants F4. Holy moly. It, it might be black is, black might be the one who's knocking, my friends. C7, F3. Wow. And it's still staying equal. And I have to admit, in my uh, little researches there, I wasn't going. I, I wasn't going full Kahuna. Mostly, I guess, because I was. I was thinking to myself, "Oh, if he gets my my e, a seven pawn too, how bad would that be?" But right, he should just give it all up. So interesting. Um, I guess in terms, I still feel it's a funny thing about the computer, right? Like. If it tells you you're wrong, do you still believe you're wrong? <laughs> you know, somebody said it um, in the chat too. They were like, aren't you afraid of E4, E3? And I do think it's the only idea for black. And the computer, by the way, wants Rook AD1, which honestly, I would never even consider Rook AD1 in this position. Um, 
but I guess, no, it doesn't make any sense to me because at the very least he could take and play, uh, take, take and play E3. And it seems like he's at least gonna get a perpetual check in that case, right? Uh, or, you know, take my pawn on, uh, well, maybe it's not too simple actually. Anyways, the computer wants F4 and I'm just gonna admit that was not, that was just not on my radar at all. It, what is was on my radar though is I felt it would be the black king who would ultimately be the one who was drafting. So really interesting position. And um, let's move to the next game and something we'll stress there. By the way, my sensei is a genius. Look at that. He's like rook 88 and rook fd1 definitely felt passive to me and yada yada. But boom, boom, boom. Yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. So I still want to take up b7. I still, still want to really take up b7. I do not want to play g4. Not in my life do I want to play g4. Okay, something I want to say. Now, I want to say a couple of nice things about Botvinnik because I kind of feel like I trashed him a little bit is that Botvinnik, I think, was the first to really promote this idea of a grand uh, strategic conception that kind of guides your game. And there's two things to see about that that are interesting that have influenced chess thinking and even probably your thinking, even if you are born fairly recently. And that is like out of the opening, you know, there's tactics and there's all kinds of stuff, but there are plans that can be developed. And one of the things that Botvinnik came up with as a strategy, a competitive strategy, was to try to develop openings that were based on ideas instead of openings that were based on tactics, because the tactics people can kind of figure out, but ideas take a little bit of let's say fluency, you gotta get used to it. You gotta kind of get your mind wrapped around some of the ideas of a position. And for example, he developed the uh, Botvinnik uh, English attack that we still see today with like a pawn on D3 in the English. He developed the Panov Botvinnik attack against the Karl Kahn. You know, so many different things, the, the um, Botvinnik variation of the Slav or the semi-slop. And so all these things, you can feel it too. Very deep ideas in those positions continue to be played today. And one of the things I want to say about that is, I just tell a quick story and then I'm going to show this game as an example of it, that when I was doing commentary for the, the U.S. junior, a wonder Liang who ended up winning the tournament was observing some of the games in the U.S. senior and the hilarious thing that he said was that it felt to him like games that were uh, from the 1990s. And it was a hilarious thing. And what he meant was that they were games with, that were being played with plans, you know, games with, uh, you know, some long-term strategic conception instead of a, a focus of chess that's more, let's call it move by move, like every move you are, reconsidering what's going on in the position. And that comes from analyzing with the computer, right? Because the computer is showing all kinds of stuff every single move and does not have any kind of strategic conception that is guiding the game. Okay, so let me show you this game as an example of a strategic game. And let's just put this position on the board and let's do this. If you want to, yeah, what I'm interested in is, I'll do a couple more moves. Let's just do a couple more. If you were gonna talk about this position, would you say that white is better? That white is, um, you know, even maybe worse? That white is much better? What would your intuition about this position be? 
And it's Black's move, by the way. But think about it just, you know, Black can do a very variety of things. Think about it, how you're just sensibility of the position and then put an exclam if you'd like me to call on you. We have one person saying slightly better for white and we'll get Arian in here again. All right, Arian, what are you, some of your thoughts on this position? Let's see here, actually, there we go. I'll move that. I don't, I'm not getting, man, I don't know if Arian's around. I'm not getting him in any case. Let's see if we can get Aranda, Aranda Panda. Mm, my, uh, okay, so I, um, I thought um, White is like slightly better um, because he has more space and like he has a D file, but I think like it's kind of like a um, Roxy bind structure. So like uh -huh. I think um, like it's really hard to win because like yeah, like Roxy binds are just hard to win for White sometimes. Okay, okay, fair enough. We have another, okay, thank you. That was great. We have another comment. I think the position is equalish because white is up in space, but black has lots of potential like a hedgehog structure. And let's just mention, right? We have, could imagine a hedgehog structure like that. Arian would like to say something. Let's bring him back. I don't know why I couldn't even get him the first time. I think it's equal because uh, white may be active, but he's king, but the pawn to the king, like e4 and f3 are a bit soft. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. So you'd say, like, Black has sufficient counterplay here. Something like that. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting thing. Now, one thing to notice is maybe to compare in your mind, like, what a, let's call it, normal hedgehog would be. And this is, I guess, a normal hedgehog, a normal Moroxy bind, however you want to call it. You know, Kostya is very fancy, by the way, and he would say something like Morotse instead of Moroxy, but here, you know, I'm just going to stick to Moroxy. That would be, namely, it's kind of tricky. It's like the bishops got traded, right? There were some bishops that were traded. And I think for Botvinnik and his time, that's a big deal. And Maybe it even is. But so the, and the point is just to say, hey, the bishop was bad. This bishop was bad. It's weird, though, because normally if you have less space, you say to yourself, oh, well, I'm just happy that, um, you know, I, I don't have that, I, I, that I traded off a piece. Normally you're just kind of happy when you have less space if you get to trade something off. So the game as it progresses, we're going to see goes very much in White's favor. But I am with uh, basically you guys, and I feel like Black should be fine in this position. And what I want you guys to see about it is nowadays, regardless of your strength even, you can look at a position like this, and just because you've had some computers analysis at some point, you can say to yourself, oh, there's going to be some tactics and stuff. But back in the day, it was more like, no, black is suffering, yada, yada. And honestly, like I've had actually a lot of positions like this as white, where if black plays passively, yes, things are going to go badly. Um, Aryan is writing e6, maybe e6, d5. I think that is absolutely a good idea. And I was thinking e6 now, maybe not e6 now, just because knight c6 could happen, but maybe like knight e5 first, and then whenever we're ready to play e6 and then look for the famous d5, look for the counterplay over here. And it is by all means complicated, but yeah, to me, I just say, you know, we can, maybe it might be fun to turn the computer on again, but to me, I just want to say it feels like full counterplay in this position. Um, yeah, let's cheat a little bit. We'll turn it on. What does it say? Oh, look at that. It says white is clearly better. I'm wrong again. <laughs> look at that. Vision G5 it says cry is wrong again. Um, yeah. Hopefully I'm not ruining Costa's capture here because I'm making the, the, the screen bigger. So uh, interesting. Actually, let's see if I take it back. 
Interesting. Okay, so the computer is fully on his side. Computer, by the way, computer loves space, even more than bishops. And that is true that white has space here. It wanted, by the way, on 95, it wanted bishop g5, presumably to try to make, you know, moves like e6 a little bit more difficult. Okay, so let me share what happened. Uh, knight d4, d6, a4, knight e8, knight e5. Snip, snip, and now a, a, a nice little move, h4. And this is also, this h4 move is kind of typical of modern chess, where you push Harry the h-pawn but not so much for back in the day. And the point is now if the knight, you can think of it even maybe as a little bit prophylactic because now the idea could be, well, if the knight goes something like e6, then I will very much consider a move like h5. So white is playing. One of the nice things about the strategic conception of this game is white plays on both sides of the board. By the way, you guys probably haven't heard of Lilienthal, famous old dude of back in the day, also played for decades and decades, died. It was playing until his 90s. Okay, so rook e8, we could debate it. Rook c3, just taking control of things. And now boom, 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 nice move. And the point being that if you take, which he did, we have rook c7. And now it is looking bad. And so, one of the things about Botvinnik and the Botvinnik school that kind of persists even in Russian chess to this day is to get a, a, an end game like this and tell yourself a story about it. And the story that Botvinnik told, which is I think totally correct, is that black is simply lost here. And why? Because we have the better rook, we have the better knight, we have the better king, and of course, we have the outside to pass pawn. So I'll just go a couple more moves. Um, yeah. There's, there's actually really nothing to do at this point, right? Totally gone. Yeah, we can stop it there. It goes on a couple more moves. So <clears throat> one of the things I want to stress about that game is that there's an idea, an old school idea of playing with a strategic, like this grand strategic conception. And I think in modern chess, it, it's, you don't see it anymore. <laughs> it's like, it's something that's kind of, uh, mm, yeah, it's just not as common to think of chess that way. But this kind of ending, let's say you reach a position like, this and you reach it in your mind first and you just say oh yeah that's totally winning and it's a mark definitely of a great player just maybe you could call it mature maturity as well of being able to say right this thing is gone this is now totally over due to the control that uh, white has in this position okay now i'm going to share a game that made a big impression on me when I was a kid. And by the way, that last game with Lilienthal and this one with Alekheim um, are games that were played before the Second World War. Alekheim, of course, kind of, he dies at the end of the Second World War. He's kind of banished by Russia anyway. And so anyway, Botman had got to play that generation of players before he was anointed as the Soviet king at the beginning of the post-World War II phase. Um, okay, so this game came up in a book uh, that I read, I don't know, when I was like 1600 or something. And it was all about, I think the title of the chapter was like Rook on the Seventh Rank. I might be remembering this totally wrong. Rook on the Seventh Rank. And uh, it was this book by Irving Chernev, like 60 Instructive Games or something like that, which I want to reread now has been, you know, decades since I read the book. In any case, part of the idea here is that the rook on the seventh rank is not only an advantage, but sometimes completely over. And this game, I think, established, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people of that generation, uh, 
that idea. Okay, so here we go. We still see this variation today, usually bishop d3 instead of bishop c4. b6, let's call that inaccurate. And right, we get this position and the idea is, is that it's already gone bad. And <clears throat> yeah, it was, maybe it's obvious for you guys, but to me, it was obvious that white was better, but it was not at all clear to me why white should be winning. And so this game, this ending, is kind of a classic example. Um, why didn't, we had a question, why didn't he go in, uh, why didn't he go queen e8? Um, maybe like queen a4, queen e8, like what, here? No, right? We got this, <laughs> we got this problem. I can't even imagine playing queen e8. It's too scary, too scary for me. Okay. Uh, maybe I got it all wrong. Maybe I got it all wrong. If you want to say something, put a little exclam. I'll bring you up. I, I'm happy to look at any variation you want to look at. So the position, though, I wanted to start off with was just this one with the idea that this is lost. And I think, I guess I'm going to say it's true. I think it is actually lost. They did loads of um analysis back in the day and back in the day by the way you know of course without any computers there would be big discussions amongst you know club players as well as professionals about positions like this and they would go on forever and they really would be debated in magazines and stuff with people submitting their analysis and part of Botmanik's whole idea of chess improvement would be that, hey, if you wanted to be a good player, you had to you know, subject yourself to that kind of scrutiny of you know, being able to have your analysis out there and feeling confident enough about it, like studying it deeply enough to be like, yes, this is correct. And of course, there's no computer back then to confirm who's right or wrong. You just have to try to convince with variations or maybe even ideas. Okay, so here we go. Rook e7, snip, snip, queen c7, snip, snip, and now f6. And f6 has to be the right move. And the idea is simple, is that the pawn on f6 dominates the knight on f3. So it really is at this point, even though the knight on b8 is ridiculous, at this point, Black, I think, is very close to surviving. Okay. Because it's really only the rook on c7 that's better. Check to the rook. Check to the king. And now we got to go back. Okay. Big moment for Black. And by the way, like to me, the value of this game is you can go as deep as you want into the analysis of say this position to think about, um, you know, the different variations and stuff. But by going through that analysis, the point, if you will, would be to say, okay, I'm gonna learn like the ins and the outs of how, of what the truth of this position is. Because if you, you know, can come to a sense of that it is winning and have a sense of like how you might do it, then, you know, then you have reached kind of the holy grail. Okay. Let's just talk about white's problems here and black's problems in a hopefully somewhat obvious way. The king on f1 is arguably better than his compatriot at the moment because black cannot play f7. Knight d7 is very uncomfortable because rook c7 then comes down. So it's very difficult to get the guy out. If you wanted to play a5, knight a6, 
it's a thought, but then after A3, your knight isn't going anywhere over there either. And then you have to worry about rook C6. So Alakine's next move, or Alyosha, if you want to be fancy, makes a lot of sense. G5. And this next move is uh, something that is debated by the people. Um, whether white should play h4 or knight e1 first. My own sense is that h4, I don't know, it just feels more right. It just feels more right. So um, it, it might not make that much, I mean, it's hard to immediately understand why it might make a difference. But the idea we got to say with knight e1 is, first of all, we must fix the knight. And the knight is definitely kind of a tricky piece because black has to worry about something like h4 and then knight d3, let's say h4, excuse me, look at me, let me get those arrows off, h4, g4, knight d3, f4. And again, the rook's better, the king's a touch better. If our knight becomes better, then, you know, then it really is curtains for black. So there's that idea. And then also there's the famous knight c2, e3, which taps not only d8, but f5. Okay, so here we go. h5, now this move, intuitively, I wanna say I'm not thrilled with because now when white plays h4, as happens in the game, you're not as flexible about how to deal with the position. On the other hand, you ask yourself, well, what do you want the guy to do? It's another good question. <laughs> what do you want the poor Alyosha to do if it's not something like h5? <clears throat> For example, king g7, let's say king g6, and Let's say rook c7 already, rook f7, rook c8. And the problem was, well, your king went to g6 and now you can't do this rook f8 move anymore. Bummer, right? So when we think about that, it's also like if, if we do that little dance and I get to trade and then I get to play 93 and you lose the pawn, that's, we're going to say probably lost too. It's a, it's a little technical right, as night end games are, but it is probably lost. Okay, so let's give h5 the benefit of the doubt, even though I'm not totally thrilled. And now big moment for white, maybe Botvinnik did the wrong thing here, but it makes a lot of sense. Now black has to make a decision. Do you push? What do you do? And if you let me take, then I, I'll be able to, you know, come back and play knight e5. Okay, so um, in the game, Alakine played knight d7 and rook c7, rook f7 comes. If g4, then knight d3 honestly just looks over, right? Because then knight f4 comes, it's like the dream. It's the absolute dream. If king, let's say, g7, we could talk about f7 too, then we got to worry about that. King f6, and then look at a move like rook c7. All of a sudden, you can't really move anymore, right? Because rook f7, rook takes, knight takes g5. The knight on uh, b8, totally not going anywhere. So that's already really, really bad. So, right, this is what I'm saying. This is like, sometimes, let me just say, I'll say this as an old guy. Even though a wonderly hag would say I play chess from the 90s, I think there are a variety of positions where you want to talk, I want to talk about uh, plans. And here the plans have to do with the the better pieces and the plans of like saying, what is H4 doing? Yes, it's concrete. And yes, there's a kind of move by move thing about it. But whenever you get a position and 
you know, you're going to say I'm winning and it's not because of some concrete variation, though we're going to definitely going to get some variation, but you're going to say well, like why as a, as a uh, let's say an explanation. That's when I think you can start talking about, for me, plans. Okay. Um, so a lot of people are talking about chess history. One thing, you know, I got turned on to, it, let's just say uh, about, I talked a little bit about it in the Bob, in the Smyslov class is just how they cheated for Smyslov, but really Bobinik was like the poster child for Soviet chess and like Soviet society in general. And the guy was cheated all the time. And it was uh, Ryshevsky who they were cheating, especially they were just like totally cheating to stop Ryshevsky from ever winning. And, you know, one of the weird things that I didn't even appreciate until very recently was, you know, Fisher was so upset that they were giving money to help Ryshevsky out, this American Chess Foundation, which I think kind of sort of still exists. But that organization was created as a Cold War, Cold War phenomenon to help Ryshevsky because they do. They knew that Botvinnik and the other people were getting help by thrown games and drawn games and that kind of thing. All right, so here we go. Knight e7, rook c7, rook f7. Now here's an interesting move. Clearly white could do, I think, a variety of things, but check it out. Knight f3, why? We are gonna force that pawn forward and then we're coming back. It's a beautiful conception. And let's look at, the dynamic way that Alekhine tries to at least make it not so easy. F5, knight d3, f4. Now a very simple move, but strong, f3. So why did f4 have to be played? Well, we needed to stop the knight from getting to f4, the white knight getting to f4. I think that it's fair to say that both players believe that if the knight got there, that would be the end. So for example, if instead of f4, you do something like knight f6, well, we're going to play both rook c6 and then knight f4. So both pieces will continue to be better. And there might even be possibilities of knight e5 too. Black structure has really become full of holes. So now one of the weird things about this position and I definitely think Alekhine, this was the Alekhine's best chance, is that we'd rather, I think, lose the pawn on f4 than lose the square. Also, he gets to exchange a pawn, which probably is a good thing. Now, should he take? It's, it's debatable because you there's no hurry, huge hurry in taking, I don't think. But he takes. Now a5, fix the pawns. King f8, and there really is a, a massive art and you know, how do you play this kind of position? Um, a lot of people, probably myself included, would just, you could, I would be in time pressure. <laughs> I'm like King e2. By the way, one thing you guys should appreciate is back in the day, totally different end games. Like now at this point, most players would already be playing on 30 seconds or close to 30 seconds increment. But back in the day, you get two and a half hours, two and a half for 40 moves, and you get another hour for the next 20, and then another hour after that. And oftentimes it just kept on going, going, and then there would be an adjournment. So the end games had a lot more depth than they do now. And when you read like the Dvoretsky and all these other old guys, they're talking about the value of studying adjournments because that was where you cut your teeth, where you really learned how to study a position. And, um, you know, right in the same way that doing analysis of your own games is the best way to improve when you are going to do an adjournment, say with other people too, and you get some ideas from them. It really is a fantastic way to get in there, get really deep inside a position and learn the dynamics of a position like this, which, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, if you, if you imagine yourself getting this position, would you 
have the courage to tell yourself that you're winning this position? I don't think I would. I would definitely think I'm better, of course, but you know, well, I don't know. Winning, that's a strong word. Okay, Rook C6. Now, the good news for us is that we don't have to worry about Rook F6 anymore. Why? Because we now have the F4 pawn. So with Rook C6, we stop the knight on D7 from moving at all. King E7 and King F2. A little bit weird, but he doesn't want, if like say King E2, he doesn't want to see Rook G7 with any kind of tempo. And part of the question is, well, like, what is black going to do? So rook f5, white can, I'm sure, do many different things. He just keeps it cool, b3, keeps it cool again, knight b8. Um, again, if you have any questions, just put a, a exclam in the sidebar. I have a question for you guys. What's wrong, if anything, with rook takes b6? This is an interesting moment. I think a lot of people would just take the pawn. They just take the pawn. And this is great uh, gamesmanship on Alakine's part, I think, where we could talk about rook b6, king c7, you go somewhere, I don't know where, and then knight c6, and we at least have a little something, something. We're probably still in big trouble with, say, king f2, knight d4, b4, something like that. I think we're still in big trouble. But, you know, we've gotten some activity, which would just feel so much better, feel so much better than the situation we just had. And a lot of these guys, too, just the credo was never... Never deny counterplay. And I really believe in that as well. And so a very nice move from Botvinnik here, rook g6. Yeah, this game really is very precise. King c7, he's still going to get it, but we deny it. Notice we're not going pawn grubbing. We are not going pawn grubbing. We are pursuing the dream of making the knight on b8 terrible. Knight a6, where else is he going to go? Check to the miserable king. Knight c6 with a dirty threat of knight e7. Notice that he's also making it difficult for the knight on um, b8 to come out. Rook f6, check. Now we finally do a harvest. Big deal that the pieces can't really come out. Rook d6, check out this move. Rook b8, g5, excuse me. Very nice move. And why? Because we are just not going to let the knight out. And now I think everybody can see visually that the game's over because the white king is now going to come in. It's not really about the pawns, right? It's about the pieces dominating. Knight b4, snip, snip, snip. And yeah, this is all the way gone. Notice that Alakine goes for for counterplay and we could stop here let's go a couple more moves and black resigns um <clears throat> so one of the you know amazing things about botvinik that really you know that the, the guy was in contact with all the greats he played he beat capablanca he beat alakai he played oiva Oiva well, is the only guy I don't pronounce in the American accent who we say you, you or something like that. And then, of course, Smyslov, Tall, Petrosian, all those guys, and then got to coach Kasparov. So, you know, this huge span, expanse of time where he was like the main guy. And, you know, it's, 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 it's weird for me, too, because I, I, don't, I don't like... I'm just going to admit it. I don't like the guy on a variety of levels. But in terms of being impressive, in terms of, you know, standing the test of time, literally the test of time, uh, very interesting guy. And you got to imagine, like, when he's playing these matches with 
say, tall in 1960, he's already ancient. He is ancient, you know? He's, he's actually my age now. 49. He's 49 when he's playing tall. And then he smokes him. And then he still has to play Petrosian. And one of the things, too, that's interesting to think about just in terms of differences between now and then is like now, Anand is very much like the only one who is capable of playing at a high level. Uh, and nobody else has been able to do it. My sensei, Smyslov, managed to you know, do it into his old age. But basically now it's the kids who are completely dominant and the older guys could, can't really hang anymore. And so one of the things I just wanted to bring that up is back in the day for Bob Vinnick and the Soviets, they actually thought that a chess player peaked around 1950, excuse me, 1950, around the age of 50, which is remarkable to think about now, given how young everybody is. And even now, when you think about like Carlson, it's almost like, oh, he's kind of past his peak at the age, the ripe old age of 30 or whatever he is. Okay, guys, I'm going to take off. You can hear my daughter in the background. She is cranking the tunes. So I got to get out of here. Thank you very much for doing this show with me. And um, I really do think that you might say to yourself, ah, oh, these old guys, it's so different. It's not important. But one thing I want to leave you with is it's important to get in a sense of chess history. And then also, as I mentioned in my lecture with Smyslov, whether it's one of these older guys or someone newer, you should find a player whose style you can kind of emulate, whose moves you understand. All right, I'll leave it there. Bye-bye.